The financial needs of a business go beyond tax and attest services. That's why CTBK goes beyond accounting services and offers outsourced solutions through their affiliation with CFO Solutions Plus. These additional services allow clients to focus on their operational and long-term strategic goals. Trust CTBK's outsourced solutions to provide cost-effective, value-added financial services tailored to your company's needs. Call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400. Or go to ctbk.com to learn more about CTBK's outsourced solutions. Welcome to another edition of Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and business consultants. Uh, as you can see, if you're watching on uh, YouTube, uh, one of the original Fs is joining us, Mike Rodak uh, from Birmingham. Uh, is that where you are right now? I guess I shouldn't say. What town, what town I am. are you in? I, I'm, I'm in Mountain Brook, Alabama. There's mm -hmm. a difference, but... Okay. From Mountain Brook, Alabama, joining Jonah Bronstein of the New Bronstein Times and, uh, and me, Tim Graham from The Athletic. Uh, Mike, it's the perfect Monday to have you on. There's so much in Rodak land that pertains to what folks are into up here in Western New York. I'll just give a quick overview. Well, huge college football game that you covered on Saturday, um, Alabama squeaking past Auburn in a fantastic game that went into multiple overtimes, uh, Alabama needing to score late to force it. Uh, you had um, Alabama basketball ranked and uh, an interesting game uh, against Rick Pitino uh, in which uh, they were upset by Iona. You have the controversy, the ongoing controversy of not putting St. Bonaventure in your top 25 <laughs> because you're an AP poll voter. Bonaventure now out of uh, the top 25. And it's Patriots Bills Week. So I don't know. I'll, I'm going to let you pick. You're the guest. Where do you want to start? Well, and there's Alabama, Georgia, which is probably the biggest game of all of those. So, right. I don't know. Let's start with Bona. I figured you would have started with Bona. I think people care most about Bona. Let's, let's go at it. I, I'm. See, I, I didn't have Bonner ranked in the preseason poll, I don't think. I'd have to go back. Or maybe I did. Maybe the 23rd. And then the first poll of the regular season, I didn't have them ranked. And that was when I heard from the Bonner Mafia, which is alive and well. And at that point, I don't think they had played anybody. Um, they had beaten Siena, I think it was. And then they had come back. Yeah. Who did they come back and Canisius at home in those games? Canisius, they came they back. Moved up nationally 22 to 21 while you moved them down. Right. I moved them down or out because I think you got to crush a team like Canisius if you're going to be a ranked top 25 mid-major team. And then they come out the next week and they play really well in the tournament. And then I had to rank them after that. And I think they were deserving of being ranked after that. And then they lose to Northern Iowa. And I think they're unranked. So the bottom mafia can come after me, but I think I've been fair to them. I think there's a lot of power conference teams, if you will, high major teams that you start like on Sunday nights and Monday mornings, you start looking through and you're like, all right, Texas Tech is undefeated. They haven't played anybody. I was undefeated. They haven't played anybody. And there's teams that just beat other good teams. And then trying to pick 25 of those out of 40, 45 deserving teams is actually pretty tough. So this is my first year doing that. Um, and yeah, I even got some Seton Hall fans coming after me last week. I'm sure there's been others that I've missed in my mentions, but I didn't know when I signed up for this, that this would all be on this college poll tracker website. And there's like advanced analytics, like the most extreme ballots and least extreme ballots. And you can see who has everybody ranked the highest and the lowest. So I think that one week when the Bonnies were unranked in my ballot, I was one of like three people to do that out of 60 two 63 votes total so people see that and that's kind of the the gist of it well mike do you what, think what do that... you get out of doing it it seems like it might be more trouble than it's worth i i accepted it just because i feel like i didn't want to say no and the ap guy down here asked me and i feel like i don't want to give it to somebody else i might as well just do it myself and 
it is definitely a lot of, uh, like you said, it's a lot of trouble. It's a lot of, uh, public shame if you don't do things right in people's eyes, but I don't know there's a certain level of, it kind of makes you watch college basketball closer and follow it a little bit closer. And there's probably a benefit to doing that. Gets your name out there a little bit. I don't mind that. Nobody tweets at you saying, thanks for ranking my team so high. No, exactly. I mean, maybe like Texas Tech fans should because I've been on their bandwagon and nobody else has. But that's – no, I mean, it's – like you said, it probably gets easier as the year goes on just because there's more of a sample size. Like these preseason polls and these first couple-week polls when teams aren't playing anybody, it's like, all right, you're undefeated, but you played like Alcorn State and, you know, Northern Delaware, whatever it is. And it's like, how do you rank those teams? How do you match up Tennessee, which played nobody versus a team like the Bonnies that played maybe a couple people? Like it's it's an inexact science this time of year, which is why we have these analytics websites. But when I use these analytics websites to have Texas Tech rank really high, apparently nobody else does either. So nobody wants to follow the numbers. It's just all this. Let's just look at it and do the eye test. And I don't know if that's the, the better way, but here we are. Mike, when you left uh, St. Bonaventure off your ballot um, the first time uh, after they struggled uh, to beat Canisius at home, do you think they were punished a bit by the fact that you know Western New York and you know Canisius? If you didn't know Canisius and Reggie Witherspoon and the history there from having covered sports in Buffalo and being aware, do you think that maybe you just think, all right, it's a there's a win? Uh, I think it can go both ways because I think if you're – let's say you live in Texas, like you're a Texas tech writer who's voting in this. And like on Monday morning, the AP will just send you, it's like a word document of like, here's who everybody was ranked last week played. And here's the result. And if you just look at that, like you see like whatever it was, like a three, five point win over Kenesha. It was, it was a pretty slim margin. And you're probably like, Oh, they had Nine. trouble against that team. Nine. Was it? Okay. Yeah. But it was a but close they, game for 30 minutes. Right. You could say like, Oh, they had trouble with a, you know, a team that's a mid-major. And so you could almost say, like, that's bad for them. But if, you, if you're if you from Western New York, maybe you knew Canisius is tough or you knew more details, it could actually could help the Bonnies in that case. So it could, it could go both ways. In this case, like, I wasn't thinking, oh, Canisius is terrible. Like, they only won by nine points. I was just thinking that that's your level of competition. You got to be playing really well against it. It's like Cincinnati in, in football, like, if you're Cincinnati and you're making a playoff, like you got to be blowing teams out by 30 points every week and not just getting by against Tulane and some of the teams that they've beaten. Well, let's, uh, let's stay with college basketball. Uh, Nate Oates's team has, uh, well, just give us your, your synopsis. Uh, I think that there have been a lot of Western New Yorkers who've uh, kept their attention on Nate Oates's program and uh, some former UB players and the coaching staff and all that stuff. And, uh, uh, the Metro Atlantic uh, comes down and uh, and did a number. Uh, were you at that game? And I guess what was that like? No, so I wasn't in Orlando because that's like the Thanksgiving. Oh, right, right. Tournament. That was in Orlando. Um, yeah. So I, we have the Iron Bowl here. This or last week it was. So like these early season basketball games, we'll cover the home games. But I mean, they play. They played this Orlando tournament. They're going to play at Gonzaga in Seattle next weekend. But that's – it's stupid how they schedule this. So you have the SEC championship game at 3 o'clock Central, and then you have the Gonzaga-Alabama basketball game, which is their biggest non-conference game. Gonzaga was number one in the country until today at 7 o'clock that night. So, like, for fans, maybe, like, you go from one game to the next. For us, like, there's no possible way we can cover both of those games. Like, we're going to be writing our you-know-what's off. Can we swear in this show? Absolutely. We're writing our asses off. After that game. That's not what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> well, I could find something else to say. But point being, like, why? Well, do he doesn't have a sack, teams? so he can't say we're writing our sacks That's off. why when you use the expletive yeah. deleted, sometimes you guess the wrong swear word. That's <laughs> right. right. I should just say we're writing our bleeps off, and somebody can figure out what I mean. Yeah, we're really sitting there writing our dicks off in, in Atlanta, and <laughs> it's like, why do they do this? It's like, I you didn't write something else. It was... um the field of 68 or a field of 69, whatever their college basketball blog is that I subscribe to now, that guy was saying like, why did we schedule college basketball being we, um, this Duke 
Gonzaga game was like a Friday night. Even the UCLA Gonzaga game was like a Tuesday night in November. Like, yeah, these non-conference games have to be this time of year, but some of these scheduling things are just well, stupid. Thanksgiving week is always a big week for these MTE tournaments. They, I, it's gotten more of a television presence, I think, over the years, but it's always been a big part of the schedule, I think. Yeah. yeah. But point being, like, we're not going to travel to these games. Like, the coverage for us is just going to be really bare bones because we're, you know, muff deep in football. And <laughs> <laughs> it's just – That's not a swear word. You can say that All right. it's not on the radio station in the country. Yeah. Um, and so that's the tough part for us, but I guess getting back to like, Oats, like people love him down here. I mean, after what he did last year, I think, you know, the first year was definitely a little shaky in terms of like, is it going to be any different than what Alabama fans are used to? Um, they were trying to play that up-tempo style and shoot a bunch of threes and it wasn't really working every game. And people are, I think we're questioning that the first year and then, even non-conference schedule last year, they weren't all that good. They were four and three. They lost to Clemson. They lost to Western Kentucky, which wasn't even the game they had scheduled. They was a backup game that they had. Um, and then they went on a tear in SEC play, went 16 and two and won the SEC tournament and went to the sweet 16. And ever since then, I mean, Oates got an extension and they're probably going to build a statue for him next. Um, I mean, it's been rough sledding for them going back. Avery Johnson, um, Anthony Grant before then, Mark Gottfried. Like, it hasn't been all that great in Alabama basketball history probably since I mean, the 80s, 70s, and 80s with Wimp Sanderson. So he's definitely bringing that back. Um, but even this time of year, it's just hard to kind of redirect people's attention away from football. I mean, there's, like, definitely a core group of, like, hardcore, diehard basketball fans. But – the casual fans probably not paying attention all that much this time of year, even though they're playing Gonzaga, even though after this they're playing Memphis, which is a top 15 team still, top 20 team. Um, then Houston, which is also a top 20 team right after that. So Final like, we don't really – yeah. Like we don't cover – we might not cover all those games, especially in person like Memphis, but we kind of still have to pay attention to it. Yeah, Memphis, been... I mean, Memphis has Penny Hardaway and some of the best freshmen in the country. That That's an interesting game. Yeah. Least. What was uh, the response to the fans uh, in losing to Iona and Rick Pitino? Yeah, there was definitely some consternation over that. Um, they didn't, I mean, the free throws were the issue in that game. So that was kind of how they lost to UCLA when they got upset in Sweet 16. If It was Herb Jones, who was their best player last year, like most reliable player, like, blue collar scrappy kind of kid and he missed four three throws in the final two minutes of the game that essentially would have won it for him and so that's the way they lost to UCLA that was still kind of in people's minds and then they go against Iona and I think they hit like 50 percent and that's same sort of case like they probably would have won the game if they hit more of those so that was kind of the frustration but it was more than that like they their offense looked terrible um they didn't get off that many threes so there's only been – now there's been three, but at that point there only been two games under Oates at Alabama where they've attempted less than 20 three-pointers. And that's like his MO, even going back to Buffalo, that shoot the three all the time. And both of those games are against Iona in the tournament last year and then this past game that they lost. So Patino was doing something that was really preventing them from shooting threes. And I kind of asked Nate about it. He said they were just guarding really hard, and he's a really hard coach. And if – you slack off, like he even looked down the baseline or the sideline and saw Patina yelling at a kid if he, if he backed off a three-point shooter. So, I mean, the guy can coach. He went, what, to Greece, and he won that, that league over there when he was exiled. That's generally not what I think of when I think of Rick Patino's success. But it, it's, it goes to the I mean, point he's no that, Newt Rockney. I mean, he, well, no. Right. I, well, wait a second. Some, some people will say yeah. he's the best coach in America. Yeah. I mean, you could take a YMCA team and he'll probably coach you to a, a championship of some sort. So, I mean, it's – that I think was the saving grace, if you will, about that loss for Alabama. If, if it was just Iona and it was, you know, Jonah Bronstein coaching them, I don't think anybody would care. Or that's not what I mean. I, I don't think anybody would um, think twice about it in the sense that, like, oh, that's a bad loss. Like, in this case – it's Patino, like you can kind of write it off a little bit that it's not just Iona. It's not just this mid-major. It's like a Hall of Fame coach. You can rationalize it. 
Right. Rationalize is, is probably the word I'm looking for. Even that, I mean, Iona went and they, they played Kansas really tough. Like Kansas lost to Anthony Grant and Dayton in that tournament. And then, so Kansas played the third place game against Iona and Iona made it like a 10 point game against Kansas. So that's a good team. I think they even got some votes in the top 25. Like, I don't think that's going to crush Alabama's season losing to Iona. Uh, it did get a lot of attention. Iona's good. I mean, they're right. prohibitive they're favorites to win the man. Right. And they're going to be back in the tournament. And I mean, they could do damage in the tournament. So at the end of the day, I don't think that's going to be a, that harsh of a, of a loss for Alabama. Did you get any sense compared to that game in the NCAA tournament against Alabama last year that Iona's better? Or, you know, anything about that matchup that could portend how good Iona might be? Yeah, I mean, Nate thinks that they have a better roster this year, even though they lost. Their, they had two senior guards last year that I think scored, like, almost all of their points into Alabama. And then they lost those guys. And then they still have a, a sophomore forward now, Nelly Jr. Joseph. And then they brought in some other guys that are high major transfers to these mid-major schools, which is, you know, probably you're going to see more of now with the transfer rules. So um, there's a Louisville kid, I think, that transferred – for that Patino got to Iona. So the talent's there. Like, that's that's a decent team. I, I don't think Alabama fans are all that upset, other than, like, it was self-inflicted because of the free throws. I like what Nate said after the game, though. He said that they could have maybe stolen a win with a few more made free throws, but he thought it was maybe good that they lost because they get to see that if they don't play well enough, they can get beat. Yeah, yeah. He was saying the same things last year. Like, he'd rather take a close loss than have a close win where – players kind of write it off and say they don't need to work hard um, because they won. Whereas like if you lose a game, you, you, there's a different response to it emotionally. Well, you mentioned Mike that uh, college football is obviously your focus now, and it's going to be a little while until you switch over to basketball full time. I think uh, if you ever really do uh, when you cover Alabama sports because of the recruiting season and not everything yeah. that goes on with the, uh, with that program, but um, I'm curious to know what your experience was like on Saturday. And, and, and also, like you mentioned at the beginning here, you've kind of come up for air. Uh, this is a, this is crunch. I mean, this is like back-to-back Super Bowls uh, to cover the iron bowl, the big rivalry game. And then of course, Alabama going up against uh, number one, Georgia. Um, so what, what's this, what's, what's this stretch like for you as a journalist? That's the worst stretch, like from a, time standpoint of the year the like, worst. some people would call it the best well from like a busyness standpoint from like whatever basketball starts like basically mid-october when you have like midnight madness and um their exhibition game and all that like once that starts going all the way through until football ends which last year was january 11th i think like this is overlap period is just every single day you're working um even this past like Thanksgiving, I worked Thanksgiving because there was a basketball game. Friday, I sort of took off. Saturday, I was up 8.30. You drive to Auburn, which is two and a half hours away, cover that game. And then we didn't leave there until 9 o'clock, 10 well, take o'clock. Us into, the- take us into the press box with, right. let's say, five minutes left in the game mm-hmm. uh, and what you need to do, what your obligations are in, in regarding – what you need to write, you know, what you're responsible for and deadlines and all that stuff. And then yeah. with the mayhem that ensues. So one of the good things about the iron bowl compared to like, even this upcoming game against Georgia is that you have an Auburn side of it. Cause we're al.com. We cover both Auburn and Alabama. So you say like when Alabama lost to Texas A&M, like Jimbo Fisher beating Nick Saban, becoming the first assistant was a big story, but we had to, I had to listen to Jimbo Fisher and write off of him. Whereas there's only another beat writer in Alabama, he had to do all the Nick Saban stuff. So we're less spread out in this case because we don't have to worry about Auburn from our perspective, but it's still the iron bowl. And we're still probably creating more content than we would for any other game, just because we know people are going to read it. And in our case, like we flip, we switch off. So every other game, one of us writes during the game and does like the instant analysis, we call it. And the other person writes more of the, um, the perspective piece, if you will, that, rewrite sort of after the game, you know, with quotes and all that. So in this particular game, I was writing the in-game one, which was not a game to be writing an in-game post because you get three quarters in and my lead is Auburn has this beatdown of Alabama and they're just kicking their ass and, um, you know, it's embarrassing and all that. And like, you're ready to roll with that story. And 
And then even that final drive, like they take the ball, what the three yard line with a minute and a half left, like 99.9% chance ESPN had it at that Auburn was going to win the game. So even going through that drive, you still have to keep your story as here's what happens when Alabama loses. And you can start kind of writing, you know, the other side of it, but it just gets jumbled. Like you can kind of have two versions, but you, you still have to like write it based off what happened. Like you can't just write Alabama wins without knowing how they won. And then right. they get down to this end of the drive and they score the touchdown. And then it's a tied game. And even just hitting an extra point was pretty monumental for them because they have all sorts of kicking historical woes at Auburn that if they had missed, missed that extra point, it would have just been another one in the, a long line of mistakes there. Um, but then it goes to overtime, double overtime, triple overtime, four Does overtimes. overtime help you then in that regard in that uh, the game's prolonged uh, and you have – I don't know if that gives bit. you time or if that's added – because they don't go to commercials or anything too. So that once you get into right. overtime, it happens fast. Like it's, it does. It can, it, do you, right. I don't know. I don't know if that buys you more and time or if overtime's it worse you. in every sport, be, in, in any sport where it can end on a play and you can't really predict when the time's going to run out. Yeah. Well, in this case, like the way that the college football rules changed, whether it was this year or last year, I forget where now it goes to two point conversions after the second overtime. Like the first two overtimes, you can kind of tell how things are going to go based off the first couple of plays. If they get the ball to the 25-yard line, are they moving the ball? Like you can kind of have a sense of how it's going to go. Um, but it, like when it's two-point conversions, it's it's happening in 10 seconds. And then the next team's up and it's their chance. And like, yeah, there's there's no time to like change everything. So at some point, I think I basically just committed to the idea that Alabama is going to win. And if Auburn had won, I would have just had to change four paragraphs and it would have taken me five extra minutes. But I mean, they, they want this stuff to be up at the end of the game or as soon as possible right. after the end of the game. So, yeah, that was tough. I mean, it was just – the problem is, like, you're not watching every single play. And that's, like, my biggest um, pet peeve, if you will, of, like, writing in the middle of the game, especially, like, in the third and fourth quarter. Like, you got to have something ready, but you're not watching every single play. And then, you know, <clears throat> there's questions about it after the game, and you're like, I don't know what happened. Like, people ask you like, – my in-laws might ask me like, Oh, what'd you think of that play? Like when this guy did that, I'm like, I don't know. I didn't watch it. Like, what, I didn't see it. I'm, I'm right. I'm like, I couldn't see it. I was too busy writing. Right. About it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's just what it is like. And so you kind of have to commit to like a, an angle early. And then sometimes like the game, like the Tennessee game this year, I remember the like Tennessee was beating Alabama in the first half. And then the rest of the game, like Alabama came back, but it was still really close. And so you're writing a story about how Alabama's, playing down to its competition or it's struggling. And then in the fourth quarter, they scored like whatever it was, 24 points. And it's this blowout where they won by 28 points. And then you look like the asshole at the end of the game because you're writing about how Alabama didn't play all that well when it had a 28-point win. But everything happened in like the last 10 minutes of the game because right. Tennessee just collapsed. So it's like – The more you... action the more action that happens in overtime or late in the game makes what you wrote before obsolete. Right. Sometimes you write all these paragraphs and then you have to just trim it down to a sentence. Yeah, because everybody's going to remember that one play or if, especially if it's like a call. You know how fans are about like officials and like if there's a call that and it didn't happen in this game, luckily, but sometimes it does where there's like a blown call and then that just becomes the story of the game. And everything you wrote in the first half about the offensive line giving up five sacks or the rushing yards being negative, like all that just seems to like matter less or it becomes like a sidebar to where like the main story of the game is this guy should have been called for pass interference, but he wasn't. I will say I'm not that sympathetic to Mike Rodick because at the new Bronstein times, we cover college football, college basketball, pro football, pro hockey, and whatever high schools in season all at the same time. So you cover softball. I've covered softball in the spring. Yeah. High yeah. school. I, I don't you think I've ever softball covered, for the first covered time. softball this year. and baseball. That was ever fall softball. That's interesting. No, no, we covered yeah. spring softball. That's like the shittiest part about like, like covering college sports compared to the NFL. Like NFL, it's over. Like once the season's over, you're just into the NFL off season. Like covering college, you go from football to the overlap period between football and basketball, immediately into basketball. And I think even last year, we got off the plane from Miami after the national title game, and that was like we got back to our hotel at like four a.m. that day. 
So we get off the plane the next day at like 6 p.m. because we had to connect through Atlanta. And then there was like an Alabama basketball game that night at like 8 o'clock. And same thing would be true this year. If they do make it to the national championship game, the very next night they play Auburn at home in basketball. So we'd have to cover that game immediately after coming back from Indianapolis. So it doesn't end. And then you go from basketball, in this case, like Alabama went deep into basketball this past year, immediately into spring football practice. And that's like a weekend thing, like where you're covering weekend practices and saving press conferences on Saturday in like April. And then there's a spring game in football. And then you go immediately into softball and baseball. And their softball team last year made it all the way to the College World Series. And their baseball team made it to the first round of the NCAA tournament. And gymnastics, you cover a little bit of that too, right? Yeah, and they won the SEC championship last year in gymnastics. We didn't cover that in person. We had to write about that too. So it's just like basically from the time football starts, and that's like SEC media days, which is the third week in July, all the way through until mid-June, whenever softball or baseball ends, there's something going on. Like there's there's not much time where you have a weekend off or – you know, you're just not much to write about, which is good and bad. Like, I'm not totally complaining about that because I do think, like, covering the Bills, it's February. Like, the hell are you going to write about? Like, you know, what's their backup right guard competition looking like for next year? Like, you just get almost too detailed when you're just covering one team like that. And, like, maybe you overcover it. But in this case, like, the downside of having this much going on is that there's never a period of the year where you feel like there's, you know, um, less to do. What's it like covering these, uh, these big games? I know, I don't think you ever covered a Super Bowl uh, with ESPN. Uh, I did. But, oh, you did? Yeah. Uh, the Patriots, Giants, the second one in, okay. in Indianapolis. Well, how do these games compare? Like the Iron Bowl, and then, of course, you have one coming up. You get, is, it, is it outrageous for me to say this is like covering uh, Super Bowls in consecutive weeks? Yeah. No, I think that's fair. I mean, I – I don't think there's a huge difference from covering like even the SEC championship game last year was dramatic and back and forth between Alabama and Florida. Um, and then honestly, like it was probably easier to cover that Ohio state championship game that they had or the Notre Dame game they had before that, than it was to cover like the iron bowl, like the iron bowl two years ago was pretty rough too. Um, Cause I was back and forth, came down to a missed field goal at the end. Like it's always the games where like, you just don't know what's going to happen. Well, not even I'm not even saying in terms of how close they are, just the yeah. magnitude, the the audience, uh, mm-hmm. the uh, not just the people in the stands, but knowing how every word is going to be dissected that you that you produce. Yeah, no, which I'm sure is uh, interesting yeah. in uh, in Alabama. It is. And I think that the saving grace there is that I'm not really in like a columnist role. So like there's much less opinion or even like there's some level of analysis and like, there's always like, we can go into the journalism lesson, but I do think there's a difference between like just writing as like a straight reporter versus writing like as an analytical reporter versus being a columnist. Like there's three different avenues there and I, I'm not a columnist, so I, I don't go down that route. And I probably did that a lot at ESPN and that's just the, the difference in the job that I am, that I have here. Um, but I, I do try to do some analysis. So like there are some like, things that you might have to go out on a limb on a little bit. That's not just like quoting people or stating facts or whatever. So yeah, there's some level of, um, we're pointing out a trend that might be, uh, inconvenient. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, I I think the biggest thing is like Saban is worshiped and like fans very rarely will question him. And so it's usually about the coordinators like if something's going wrong, people wrong. Did you hear that? That's unfortunate. Um, <laughs> something's rubbing off on me. If something's going wrong, then <laughs> it's going to be about the coordinators. It's going to be about Bill O'Brien. It's going to be Pete Golding in this case, their defensive coordinator. It's it's always like shit flows downhill here. So you can't really question Saban. If you do, like there's going to be a mob coming after you. So um, I say that's like the tough part, but I don't think the coordinators always deserve hundred percent of the blame either. So it's, it's sort of a balance there. Coming from the Northeast and covering the NFL, when you get into these college rivalries, the iron bowl and college football, 
do you subscribe to the hype and the importance? Do you feel like these are as big of a games as they're made out to be, or, or is your perspective any different? Uh, I think they are. I mean, like people love the regular season game. Like regular season games in college football mean a lot. Like they're very important because there's only four teams that make the playoffs. So it's not just the playoff games that mean a lot. Like it's – you can – be playing Tennessee in October. You can have the Iron Bowl, which is which is a regular season game, and that like means, I think, a lot more than like an NFL regular season game does, or especially like baseball or basketball or hockey, or there's just so many of them. So, and the playoffs are so long in those sports. So, I don't know. It's I, I think it's definitely it, like it's worth the the attention that it gets. I mean, people care a lot more about these games down here than they do even the Super Bowl or. Um, NBA finals or definitely the Stanley cup or any of that. Like this is, this is the holiday. This is the one sports. This is the high holiday of the sports calendar, if you will. What uh, about Monday's uh, high holiday? Um, tell us what you think about your beloved new England Patriots and, <laughs> uh, and their hot streak. What is it? Six in a row. Uh, they're <laughs> a full game ahead of the bills in the AFC East standings. And uh, Jonah and I were just talking about this a couple of nights ago. The one surefire thing that you could count on this year, the lock was going to be not necessarily the Bills getting to the Super Bowl, but the Bills were going to win the AFC East. Uh, right. And here they are um, looking up at the Patriots yet again. Yeah, it's interesting. I honestly wouldn't have expected it myself. Like, I think to me coming in, I think the Patriots ceiling would have been like a wild card team that maybe was able to make some noise in the playoffs, but to see them, especially after the way they started and that sort of verified what my thinking was going into the year, um, what they've done lately is pretty impressive. And I think honestly, like people will talk about Mac and I think Mac deserves a lot of praise, but it's the defense getting better that I think has the Patriots where they are more than anything else, because it was the defense that was the biggest problem early in the season when at the Cowboys game, which is the last time I lost, I think, um, the, the Saints game, like there were some some serious breakdowns defensively that they were having, even going back to last year. At the end of last year, they didn't look all that great defensively either. So, like, you want to talk about why the Patriots are, what, the number two seed right now in the playoff race. It's just about the defense or just as much about the defense as it is about the offense. And I think they have the quarterback now who can kind of clean things up compared to what Cam was doing last year and, and kind of keep things a little bit steadier. Like, I don't know if Mac's still going to throw for 350 yards against the Bills and, and three touchdowns, but I think he can avoid the, the mistakes and, and make some plays that, like, even last year, what Cam had to fumble going down against the Bills, and that probably or did cost him the game in that case. So, um, I don't know. It's, uh, they definitely exceeded expectations, I would say. I haven't really watched like every single one of their games. We get some of them down here because of Mac. Um, in, in the Alabama market, but there's also some games where I just can't, you know, I got other stuff going on on Sundays. So I haven't really watched, I'd say I probably watched like 40% of their games this year, probably the same is true for the bills. I think the night games that the primetime games are a little bit easier for me to watch, but you know, the bills, I think the story with them just seems like they're, they've been figured out a little bit. Um, and, and how much that pendulum swung, like even I remember when I covered them, not just the end, but like, 2015 2016 like they're all about the run and like this hard-nosed running team and we're talking about like all right the bills need to get with the 21st century and, and get a quarterback and have a passing game but it's like that pendulum swung so far to the other direction where all like all of their success last year was because of josh beasley and Diggs. it seemed like and then the defense being good enough last year like it seemed like that was the reason why they got so far and then when that whole operation with the passing game didn't go as well, you know, through the first half of this year, it's like, what else did they really have to lean on? They didn't have a running game to lean on. You know, their defense has been very good, probably better than it was last year, but you still can't rely on that every single week to win. And it just seems like once people kind of figured out Josh and figured out what Dable was trying to do offensively with the passing game, there wasn't really that next step, that reaction to try to stay ahead. Um, which I think the Chiefs have kind of met the same sort of resistance this year, but it seems like now they've they've kind of found another way to win. 
I wanted to ask you a little bit about Mac Jones and uh, what you've seen from him. I know, like you say, you haven't watched every Patriots game, but he certainly seems to be getting better as the weeks go on. And uh, probably unfortunate that the Bills didn't get a chance to play the Patriots a little earlier in the season. Both games uh, still to come as Mac Jones seems to be getting more and more solid. But uh, he's completed 70 percent of his passes, uh, 16 touchdowns, eight interceptions. He's averaging 238 yards a game um, and he's spreading the ball around. It's not he seems to have a pretty good variety of targets uh, at his disposal. Uh, But from your experience covering Mac Jones, having seen him um, play uh, as much as you did down in Alabama, what's been your your take on on his season? Yeah, so strangely enough, I think PFF actually had this past game as his worst of the year. Um, so as like better as he's gotten through the year, this actually seemed like a step back, even though the stats weren't, even though the stats were actually better than maybe his PFF grade was. Um, again, I really watch a whole lot of the game, so I can't speak exactly to what happened against the Titans, but I'd say in general, like Max deal at Alabama was he was always very accurate. He was very smart. Um, to me, the biggest thing that stood out was like him in the pocket and his ability to kind of move left and right and up and down and avoid pressure, feel the pressure, get the ball out to where it needed to be. You know, some quarterbacks and Tua was probably in that category where he would just try to make too much happen in the pocket and run around and that's where he got hurt a few times and seems like maybe in the NFL that's happened to him too. Like Mac knows when to get rid of the ball and just has a really innate feel for that part of the game. And I think his arm is better than what people give it, give him credit for too, where like the deep passing game was actually more of a factor with him at Alabama than it was with Tua the year before. Tua was a lot of like the quick slants and the RPO stuff where he was getting the ball to Jalen Waddle and to Judy and Ruggs at that time. And, those guys were just running with it. Whereas Mac, I think was throwing downfield a little bit more, especially off the play action. So his, his arm is pretty good. I think he's mobile enough. The thing that where Saban will talk about, like kind of Mac needed to improve was the, um, the emotional aspect of it. Like he would get hit um, or he would throw a pink, a, a, a interception or a bad pass. And he would kind of like sulk after it and, and kind of do all this, acting or this John McEnroe type of stuff is kind of how Saban referred to it. That was even his nickname down there because he would throw a fit after every incomplete pass that he had. And you know, I guess teammates kind of picked up on that and there was a negative uh, effect that that had. So for Mac, I think it was trying to be more um, even keeled, more centered emotionally on the field. And I think he's done a better job of that. He definitely did when he became a starter at Alabama. And that's kind of when I covered him when Tua got hurt um his junior year and then Mac came in in the iron bowl and he threw two um pick sixes and came back each time and he, he threw a touchdown um immediately after both of those and kind of stayed in the game and and then had the perfect season last year so it seems like the Patriots too like he, he's done kind of the same thing where he'll he might have some bad plays I think it was the Cowboys game where he threw the pick six to Trayvon Diggs and then they get back right on the field the very next play he throws like a 75 yard touchdown to Kendrick Bourne. So kind of came back right away and um, avoided sort of that the woe is me mentality, which he's going to need to do. I mean, this I'm sure this game Monday night, people are going to be liquored up a little bit in Orchard Park. And, um, you know, you couldn't have that sort of experience downtown, I'm sure. If you ever built a downtown stadium, you just can't possibly have an experience like the one that they'll have in Orchard Park on Monday night. You don't want to displace all those residents of the third ward to have that experience. Right. The first ward. Either one. <laughs> either one. <laughs> third right, third right. ward country. Mike, do you see any similarities with Mac Jones and Tom Brady coming out of Michigan in those early years with the Patriots? Yeah, I mean, that's always – I remember, like, when Mac was going through the pre-draft stuff, um, like, all sorts of – Boston TV stations and websites wanted me to come on and talk about Mac. And that was always the question asked, like, does he have this comparison to Brady? Cause I think Kuiper had kind of thrown that out there and it kind of got legs like yes and no. Like I think his, his strengths align with what Brady's strengths were, which is like that pocket presence and um, ability to get rid of the ball and know where to put the ball and be accurate. But like, whenever you say like, this guy's the next Tom Brady or like he compares to what Tom Brady was early in his career. There's a so much um, 
baggage that comes with that. Like you're, the expectation is that this guy is going to become the next Tom Brady and win seven Super Bowls and play 25 years and all that. Like, I don't know if Mac will be at that level, but I think like the qualities that Mac has and that the things that he's good at on the field are similar to what Brady's were. And, you know, how far that gets him, I'm not totally sure. I think there's other quarterbacks certainly that are in that category. Like I think like Eli Manning might not be a terrible comparison. Matt Ryan's another comparison that people have made for Mac. Um, you know, there's pocket quarterbacks who are accurate and, you know, are smart and have pocket presence and all that. Like that's, that's kind of the group of quarterbacks that he's in. He's not Mahomes. He's not Josh Allen. He's not Lamar Jackson. Like, it's kind of towards the other end of the spectrum. It's getting to be a uh, coach vacancy season or coach uh, job hopping season. Uh, Cliff Kingsbury obviously been in the news about the Oklahoma job. So uh, where do we start reporting that Doug Marone might land? Uh, Alabama honey, offensive line coach. Uh, honey, Doug Marone. Line. I, I don't, uh, I don't think it's looking great for him right now in terms of keeping his job at Alabama. Oh um, yeah, I, I think uh, that's been Alabama's biggest problem area this year has been the offensive line. I think there's been a lot of frustration on Saban's Uh-oh. part about just how that group is. Even today, somebody asked him about right, hell. I'll pull up the quote. I just tweeted it an hour or two ago. Saban said we we need to play more physical and aggressive on the offensive line uh, in terms of like technique and all that, which that's pointing directly to coaching. And we got to try to dictate we're moving in the run game, get moving like. Sounds like Sean McDermott. Yeah, it's like Saban, I think, has um, not been terribly pleased with the offensive line this year, and I think that's a reflection of Maroon. There's a lot of talent in Alabama. They have five-star kids all across that offensive line, and, I mean, their left tackle is still going to be a top-five pick, Evan Neal. Like, you're going to be hearing his name really early in this draft, but the other four spots have been a little bit of an adventure. They had to switch out their center in the second half of the iron bowl and then he came in and he had a bad snap. They had to switch out their right tackle, which has been a revolving door. Um, so I, I do think there's a chance that Marone just won't be back at Alabama. Um, even if Phil O'Brien stays. And I think those guys kind of came not necessarily as a package deal, but I think they brought in Bill O'Brien. I think O'Brien recommended to bring in Marone given that they have all that history together. And, um, you know, I think at first I was like, all right, here's this ex NFL coach. It's like he's overqualified for this job. Like he's probably going to be a great offensive line coach, even though he wasn't a great NFL head coach. But um, they've taken a step back from last year when when Kyle Flood was their offensive line coach, and he was a former head coach himself. But what about Bill O'Brien? And if Bill O'Brien were to get a head coaching job, maybe Doug Marone, you know, fails upward and uh, ends up on a on an NFL staff with, uh, with Bill O'Brien. Yeah. I don't know if an NFL team would hire O'Brien again right away. Um, that would be surprising. I think at this point in O'Brien's career, it's almost like, do you try to position yourself to be the next Belichick, which it seems like from reading that Wickersham story, he might've already been trying to do in, in Houston. Um, but I think you're probably more selective in his case when you're going for your second job. And I think NFL teams are going to look at what happened in Houston and probably, you know, take a second look at him as well. So, and maybe in his case, it's like if Josh McDaniels goes and becomes a head coach again, whether it's this off season or next off season, you go up to new England and be the offensive coordinator there and then try to, you know, remain in that seat until Belichick retires that that could be one path forward for him. But I'd say it's more likely he becomes a college head coach first. If he does want to jump back into that fray and he's, like when we first talked to him, in fact, the only time we talked to him because Saban doesn't let his coordinators talk outside of one day in August. Um, he said that he considers himself more of a college coach. He's actually spent more of his career in college going back to Penn state. And then before that he was at Georgia tech um, and Maryland and a few other places. So Duke. Um, so I could see him. I mean, so have you spoken to Doug Marone at all? No, no, we were not allowed to interview um, position coaches at all. Nobody is. So I've seen precisely zero quotes from Doug Marone since he took over um, as Alabama's offensive line coach. You get a chance and, to even say hello or do you and pass they each have other? Not, they have barred us from covering practice all of uh, the last two years because of COVID. 
even though we're standing outside, you know, 50 yards away from these guys, like, I don't think we're going to transmit anything. Um, we haven't watched a single practice since the 2019 season. So, wow. There's just no, there's no interface. And that's sadly, it's probably becoming the, the way of the world in our business. And, you know, in 2021 and even going forward is that everything is zoom and you have like so much distance between these guys. That's the biggest frustration. It's like, even post game, post game Iron Bowl for Nick Saban was Zoom. And I'm sitting in the back of the press box trying to, and they had like Brian Harson, the Auburn coach, being broadcast over the speakers in the press box, and you're trying to listen to the Nick Saban over your computer. I mean, that was a pain in the ass, but it's just kind of where we're at in this business. You think Doug Marone still has the cachet to get a like a Syracuse level college job, or is he his name plummeted too much? Um. Maybe, like, I think you'd have to want it. It's like, what does Doug Marone want to do? How old is Doug Marone? He's got to be, like, late 50s at this point, right? I mean, look, he's 57. So, it's like, at that point, does he want to go and coach at Southeast Missouri State just to, be, just to become a head coach again? Like, I don't know if that's what he'd want to do. Um, not having talked to him, I'm not sure, but. It seems to me like if, if this doesn't work out at Alabama, maybe he goes and finds a friend in the NFL, like you're right, like Phil O'Brien maybe, and just becomes an offensive line coach in the NFL again and kind of coaches out his years doing that. But I don't see him becoming an NFL head coach again. I don't see him having the name recognition or the, um, you know, the, the – you, you don't get three chances. No. And he's already and and obviously with what happened with the New York Jets, you know, being, uh, you know, dead on arrival because of uh, some reporting by uh, Manish Mehta and it's really kind of sabotaged him uh, there. And he didn't do well in Jacksonville. And he still which it's amazing to me that he was getting these looks anyway. And it speaks to his influence, uh, his agent's influence, uh, Jimmy Sexton. Uh, to be able to keep his name out there and and such and to be in demand for as long as he was, he quit on his team. He he quit on the Buffalo Bills. He took a payout. Yes, it was in his contract and all this other type of thing. It was a clause, but he really did walk out on his team, like like Bobby Petrino did with the Atlanta Falcons. And then these guys keep getting jobs. It is amazing to me. Uh, yeah, but I, I mean, don't think he gets a he's third. He's well liked by other NFL. coaches. Right. Well, and Saban is a Sexton guy as well. So Sexton has been known to kind of funnel coaches to Saban. I'm sure beyond the Bill O'Brien connection, I'm sure that there was a Sexton connection as well in trying to land Marone somewhere. But I think the other problem with Marone, and this has kind of been seen in college football too, like it's hard to be this guy from the Bronx who has a pretty extensive coaching history in the Northeast between the Bills and the Jets and Syracuse to get like a major college football job where the major college football jobs are. Like there's very few of them, unless you're talking like Penn state or Syracuse or BC, they're all down here. Like if you're going to be a big name head coach, it's going to be down here. And like Joe Moorhead, when he was the coach of um, Mississippi state, like everybody just kind of says like, Oh, it wasn't a great fit, but you kind of dig into that. It wasn't a great fit because Joe Moorhead is like a Northern guy. And then there's this idea that like, if you're down here, you got to be like a Southern guy to be a head coach of a football team. And Doug Marone's not this Southern guy. Um, the same thing at, at Auburn, like Brian Harson, and like people always kind of use the words, like he's not a great fit because he's from the Pacific Northwest. Um, like there's, there's definitely like a, a type that you, you would need to be like, if you're going to be an SEC head coach or, um, Big Ten or Big Twelve, like what's well, like when the Montreal Canadiens uh, don't have a, a coach uh, that speaks French, right? The fans get upset, and right. uh, it's actually it's an actual thing, and uh, the South is, is its is its own thing, as as right. I'm sure you you found out years ago. Yeah, and I, that's why I don't think that's really the landing spot for him for Marone is is to be a head coach in college, and I don't think he's going to be a head coach again in the NFL. So I think. He either has to become a coordinator and he really doesn't have an extensive experience as a coordinator. He was for the saints, but that was Sean Payton who was calling the plays there. Like, I don't know if you're, you're looking for like an innovative offense, offensive coordinator to run a new offense. I don't think Doug Marone's going to be the first name that comes to mind. You can run the Doug or not. Nate Hackett. Um, yeah. Nate Hackett, honestly, is probably going to become an NFL head coach sooner rather than later. 
So maybe Nate Hackett gets a job and he hires Doug Marone as his offensive line coach. I could see that happening. I could see a Hackett. Syracuse reunion or maybe even – I don't think this will happen, but if the Buffalo job opens in a couple of years, I, I could see Doug Marone being a name that might – that would be a hard yeah. sell for that fan base with all of them having known his history in that town. Um, what are you referring to there, Mike? The Buffalo head coaching job. Oh, Buffalo. Yeah. Oh, UB. Oh, it, oh, oh. UB. I, thought you were, I, I thought you were referring to Syracuse because no. there is an aspect to that. I mean, he – Yeah. I think that the Syracuse fan base was really, you know, upset the fact that he came there as a graduate and said this was his dream job and he was gone in, what, three years? from his dream job. And he was constantly a name to watch. You know, he was always, he was looking for his next job pretty much the moment he stepped foot on campus. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like maybe like Temple's coach just got fired today. Like Temple could be like a, a caliber of school where I think he could go, but like not right now. Like, is, is he supposed to walk in and say like, I just coached this Alabama offensive line as the weak link of this Alabama team. And you should hire me as a head coach at the FBS level. Like, I don't see that being a selling point. Well, like they could, they could sell it as I was the offensive line coach for the team that won the national championship. Theoretically. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe, right. if this uh, happens. and people don't look at it much deeper than that. So from a PR right. standpoint, you can get a former NFL coach. Oh my gosh, what's this going to do for recruiting? This is going to be yeah. amazing. Uh, former fan. NFL coach. And he's from the Northeast. He's from the Bronx. And right. yeah, you said Temple's actually a pretty good, good example. Yeah. Temple that would be, or, um, Rutgers or something Rutgers, like that. Yeah, yeah. UConn. It seems like a UConn. Guy. UConn needs a coach. Well, they just hired well, uh, Jim hired. Mora. Yeah. No, Who, Jim yeah. Mora is kind Excellent of a head coach. Doug Marone type, right? Yeah, I forgot about Jim Mora. Yeah, I forgot. Well, I, that UConn hired a coach. I was. Is, I, was, I forgot that UConn had a football team. Any other podcast in the world talking so much about Doug Marone right now as we are. <laughs> I bet maybe there's an Alabama podcast, Alabama maybe, football. It sounds right, like yeah. that might be the thing you would be talking about. Like yeah, you said earlier, shit runs downhill. And uh, so it's not Saban's yeah. fault. It's this Doug Marone. There's Bill O'Brien hate accounts. There's Doug Marone hate accounts. Like people are not uh, not high on those guys here. So, but I think O'Brien's safer. Like I think unless he gets a job somewhere else, I think he'll probably be back here for next year because I do think that Saban in general has been happy with the offense. But, again, the offensive lines has been their problem, and I, I do think that's that poses a risk for, for Maroon's job security because Saban definitely has been known to, to get rid of some guys that it, where it isn't working. The Bills O-line was bad under Doug Maroon. That was the weirdest thing about his tenure. Well, yeah, they – remember they signed Chris uh, – what was it, Chris Williams, the guy from the Bears that they signed to this big deal, and he was terrible. Uh, um. Cyrus Quanjo, they drafted under Maroon, and he was terrible, an Alabama guy. Um, I don't know. They just didn't really develop guys when they were – They had good – they had a couple minutes. of good players also, which was interesting. You know, they had Eric Wood. I right. mean, he's, he was a good player, uh, and he was still in his prime at that time. Um, yeah. They didn't have Richie Incognito yet. It was yet, before Incognito. They, they couldn't run Cognito. the ball. Like... They had Cordy Glenn, who was good at that time. Um Doug Ligurski, they kind of pulled off the street. Uh, Doug Ligur hey, he started in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Sam Young, I think, was a starter there. Um, Eric yeah, Piers. Eric Piers, yeah. It was a patchwork. Reinhardt. I don't think they were better for having Maroon. Like, usually, like, that's one of my – not. I don't know how to put this. Like, when I, when I think about Sean McDermott, I think of him as a DB's coach. So that's what he is. And so I'm not surprised that, like, Poyer and Hyde – have done as well as they have, or Tredavious White came in and, and did as well as they have. Like that's that should be the best part of your team. If you have a guy like McDermott as your coach, your your secondary should be the best part of your team. Should be the most well coached. Like that's that's his specialty. And so when you have Marone as your coach, the offensive line sucks. That's a problem. When you had Rex Ryan as your coach and your defense sucked, that was certainly a problem for him as well. Well, Mike, I've enjoyed this. And uh, I appreciate you making time uh, when you're in between your two Super Bowls and with some basketball going on, too. Yeah, I enjoyed it. How's the family? When, when's Mike making a personal visit back to Western New York? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'll have to schedule one. I, I haven't thought of it too much, but I, I will at some point. We'll have to uh, An official visit. Out. I need to 
invite all my St. Bonaventure friends up and we can all have a, a pint at uh where do you go now? Amherst Dale House? Yeah, on the yeah. pie tracker. There we go. Are they yeah, that's uh, actually let me, sponsor uh, of this podcast? Yeah, absolutely. Nice Amherst see, Pizza yeah, Nail House. See, I should get a little cut of your uh your winnings for saying that. Mike, why don't you fly up here and we'll drive down to a Bonnet game and maybe they'll treat you with front row seats like Adrian Wojnarowski. <laughs> I can be the sideline reporter. Yeah. Wasn't he the sideline reporter for one of those games? You still got that ESPN mic you could carry around? I don't. I don't. I think it would be better off if I didn't because I'm sure that would identify me even more. You know, Mike, I'm glad you brought up Amherst Pizza and Ale House because it's a great place to watch all the college and pro football games. Amherst Pizza and Ale House is located at 55 Cross Point Parkway in Getzville. That's right off Miller's Point Highway in the 990. A bunch of TVs indoor and on the patio. Even when it's cold out, they have the heaters out there on the patio so you can get out of there and uh, get some fresh Western New York air, which I'm sure you miss, Mike. Recognized oh, by ESPN.com, and you might have had something to do with this, as Western New York's top spot to watch sports. I don't know if I did, but I'll take credit for it either way. So you can stop in uh, or call for takeout and delivery, 716-625-7100. 716-625-7100. Amherst Pizza and Ale House. See? See, look at you, just just like the old days when you were co-host, you're just leading me right into oh, yeah. and right into an ad read. Yeah. I'm just you still got it. Irizati. We miss him. We do. Crooked road. <laughs> See? I thought we'd go the entire episode without a crooked road act reference, but Oh really? You didn't want that to happen. No, I just wanted to see what would happen. I don't know. I didn't know if maybe he'd bring it up himself, but we made it through the whole Bana segment without that being mentioned. And I thought that was the minefield. So it was just kind of a bet I had with myself as to whether or not it would be said. And I couldn't state it publicly because then one of you would have said it. Well, I wasn't thinking it, but now here we are. I want to ask Mike why he doesn't cover South Alabama and some of the other smaller colleges. Well, we cover the hell out of South Alabama. It's just not me. So, like, when AL.com, so, like, legacy-wise, like, where are the Birmingham News, the Huntsville paper, and the Mobile paper in Alabama when they all came together and became, like, a digital conglomerate? So, like, we have people who are still left over from Mobile, um, a lot of them, actually. And so we cover a lot of South Alabama. But – who do you yeah. not cover that you get complaints about then? Sanford. So, like, oh, we only have two people here in Birmingham compared to, like, four people in Mobile, even though Birmingham's twice the size. And Sanford's one of the schools in Birmingham, which, like, they're Division One in basketball, like, mid-major, low-major, you could even say. Um, Football-wise, they're FCS. But, like, we're <laughs> – Sanford's not going to get any page views. I can tell you that, but we still have a guy who emails us damn near every single day with links to like every single game story on Sanford's website saying that we're lazy. And we Doesn't he FOIA you it. for, he FOIAs you? Yeah, for he even threatened one time that like he knows lawyer friends and like, you know, he's going to sue us in federal court because we're not covering Sanford enough. <laughs> so, even the last email I think he sent to us the other day, Saturday maybe, he like CC'd a lawyer on it. I looked this guy up. He's like a media lawyer in South Carolina or something. And we're shaking in our shoes that a federal judge is going to sanction us for not writing enough stories about Sanford. I think Bonn is going to class action lawsuit you for not ranking them. Maybe they will. But like Birmingham has UAB, which is an FBS team now. Um, they're going to be in the American Conference. Jacksonville State's not very far and they're moving up to FBS now. Like Sanford is at the bottom of the list in terms of schools in Birmingham that are division one that we would cover. And we only have two people in Birmingham and we have our hands full with Alabama as I've gotten into before. So there's just no time or money really left to cover all these other schools. A good time was had by most on this podcast. <laughs> and uh, I appreciate uh, the discourse. Mutual. Uh, let's, uh, let's ha have a great holiday season and, uh, let's do this again soon when you, uh, when you have time, I, I won't, uh, I won't abuse the access that you give me, Michael, by, uh, by dipping into the well yet again, uh, before the end know. of the football season, but 
That's all right. I'm going on the same radio station of Mobile this afternoon that I did this morning. So you want to be the first to abuse my time. I see. Well, we'll talk to you again when the Bills and the Patriots meet in the playoffs. Sounds good. All right. Thanks. That's Mike Rodak from AL.com. And this has been Tim Graham and Friends brought to you by CTBK, CPAs and Business Consultants. CTBK is more than just a full service accounting firm. They are one team with an innovative approach to accounting and rise to each new challenge with collaborative problem solving skills. CTBK goes above and beyond by lending helping hands in the Buffalo and Niagara community through volunteer work and donations and has partnered up with Victory Sports for 2020 and 2021 to keep kids in the community active. The professionals at CTBK are determined to help individuals and businesses succeed. Whether a large corporation, a small business, or somewhere in between, call CTBK at 716-630-2400. Again, 716-630-2400, and see what CTBK's one-team approach can do for you. We'll